Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this. Back with Mr. Henley, we're going to talk about Unit 2, Telling the Story. I want to get into, kind of put on my English teacher hat to some extent. We're going to be talking a little bit about story and the brief history of stories and how that interacts with Hollywood. The people who tell the stories, now in English class, you're you have authors, people that write books that are your storytellers. And here it's typically your directors and such. So we're going to be kind of touching on a lot of different things in this unit as we move along here. But I want to get into some various different things. And we'll, we probably need to start off with a brief history of stories. And this is honestly something I didn't realize for a long time. But our guy Aristotle here, um, going back you know, 335 BC, so we're talking about 2,500 years ago. Uh, was the classical unities. And I, I've heard of Aristotle, of course, but I never heard of these three classical unities. Or if I have, I've forgotten about them. But these are the unofficial rules for drama that would last for over a thousand, if not two thousand years. Um, the idea being the unity of action. Uh, and remember, you have to remember, this is not movies or anything, or it's not even books, really. It's, it's, we're talking about a play. We're talking about actors on a stage and people sitting in an amphitheater or in the auditorium listening and watching the actors act. So the idea is the unity of action. A play should have one main action that it follows, no or very few subplots. The unity of time. The action in a play should take place over no more than 24 hours. So it should happen within a reasonable amount of time. It should be pretty quick. We're not talking about long, extended amounts of time. And then the unity of place. A play should cover a single physical space and should not attempt to compress geography, nor should the stage represent more than one place. Now, if you've ever been to a play, you know that's probably not true anymore by any means. But these three unities, action, time, and place. So interesting idea, I, I did not realize that. And um, so let's fast forward a couple of millennia and get to good old William Shakespeare. And he was a big game changer for this. And I always knew that Shakespeare was considered to be a big major player in all this, but to be honest, I didn't really know why. And so this is kind of new to me too, but uh, one of the first major playwrights to violate the classical unities, only two out of Shakespeare's set of plays, The Comedy of Errors and A Midsummer Night's Dream, will actually observe all three of the classical unities. But the idea of the same happened in the same place is not true. The idea that it all has to happen at the same time or same 24 hours is not always true. Um, and the, you know, the idea that it's only one action or only one plot, you know, obviously there's usually multiple subplots, I mean, that are going on. So breaking the traditional will rules, Shakespeare changed the way the audience has understood and observed theatrical drama. So this was a big game changing in that it's okay to tell stories in a different way. And even today, if you do anything, if you look into anything with screenwriting and things like that, and there, we'll, we'll probably look into a couple of those ideas, in screenwriting, there is this idea of a movie typically has this particular flow, the three state, the three act uh, movie and things like that, or the five acts. And there's all sorts of different versions. And we'll look at a little bit of that in this unit. That's part of why I'm calling this unit telling the story, because, you know, how do we tell movies? How do we do these things? And a lot of the methods from writing um, and stage plays goes into movies as well. So a sign of the times, if you recall, cinema was established pretty clearly by 1897, but you know, mid-1890s, late 1890s. Um, during the late 19th century, there were a variety of Victorian leisure activities. There were optical toys like the zoetrope or the stereoscope. There were cards that showed exotic locales, stage narratives. A lot of middle-class families owned pianos, apparently. You know, so being able to play music it was a big deal. You know, it may not even have been a piano. It could have been a guitar. It could have been a violin, um, various musical instruments. Literacy was starting to increase. It also allowed for more fiction. People needed to read. They wanted to read. This was a way for them to escape and to learn new things. And so increasing literacy made cheaper little popular fiction, you know, novels and magazines and stuff that people were buying up. Printing photographs led to picture books that could take readers on journeys to exotic lands, places they had never been. Um, and the cinema would just be one more nuance in all of these different leisure activities, as we've said. 
some early film genres that I feel like you should be aware of in case you know. So nonfiction films were sometimes referred to as actualities. And actualities were pretty much usually very short because remember early film was only like a minute or two long at the most. So these were these short films that recorded a nonfiction event, a real life thing, and they showed kind of like a slice of life. This is again people leaving the factory. This is um, a train riding by. This is the waves at the ocean. It's those types of events that you're looking for. It's an actual event happening. There's no narrative. There's no story. It's uncut. It's, it it starts with the film and it ends once the film shot stops. Scenics were short travelogues. They showed scenes of distant lands that people typically didn't get to go to. There were topicals that depicted the news. And we haven't talked about this very much, but a part of the Nickelodeons and these early cinemas was as a news source as well. So they would show these. And a lot of times the cameraman was not on point on scene to film prominent news. And even and you know, nowadays, almost everybody carries a video camera with them in their pocket with their cell phones. But th those days... A lot of people were not there, so a lot of times these things would be recreated in studio. So, for example, in 1898, both European and American producers used model ships in miniature landscapes to depict the sinking of the battleship Maine and some other key events during the Spanish-American War. Now, it's believed that even though they did these recreations, it's believed that the audiences at the time realized they were recreations and that they were not the actual event as it happened, but you know, it was still appreciated as the kind of show. Even today, you see them do reenactments and things of, of various footage. You know, and they'll or they'll do like you know CGI. You know, what we think happened with the trajectory of the bullet, those types of things. And we realize they're not real, but they're useful to kind of understand what we believe happened and so forth. Fiction films were also important, including comedies such as the Lumieres. Um, and I'm butcher the pronunciation here, but Erosuar Erose, which is the water rewarded, which I believe you've already had an opportunity to view at this point. If not, you should go watch it. It's worth watching. It's only a minute long. Um, so understanding the times, to us, these films may seem strange and weird. It's like, why would you even film this? Why would you even bother with this? But remember, a lot of these early films, the, the movement of the movie, of the film, was the novelty. And so a lot of these also have contemporary media, I mean, in media of our times, has an equivalent to these. So like a topical is basically like a news clip. You know, we record the news now, we show the news, we show, you know, oh, here's a clip of this politician speaking and saying that thing, and, you know, and so forth. But, you know, so that's what a topical basically did. Now, those, again, these were usually before sound, but even after sound, they still had them. Uh, scenics allowed viewers to see places they'd never seen, not unlike documentaries, and many of the comedy shorts and so forth are really, they're not any different than what you saw on YouTube or Vine. Remember when Vine was a thing? Or TikTok or other social media that we see these days. Um, a little bit about actualities, because I do want to mention that. Um, so early film audiences did not differentiate so much between fact and fiction. And it doesn't mean that they didn't understand there was a difference between fact and fiction, it's just they didn't feel the need to specify this is fact this is fiction they just took it for what it was these were real life films usually no longer than one or two minutes they were basically viewed like a living photograph and again remember a lot of the early novelty in movie theaters was the fact that most these pictures were moving just the fact that the picture was moving was enough to be amazed and you and the analogy that keeps working in my head is you're like yeah well i mean it's a photograph. I mean, I, but imagine if a photograph started to move. You know, imagine if you were not a muggle and you were actually in the Harry Potter world and saw a moving picture like what they have. You you would be fascinated by it, and it's the same thing here. They depicted scenes of everyday life. They did not have a bigger narrative like a documentary, and they did not have a story behind them like a narrative would. And the earliest actuality is probably La Sorte des Unicines Lumière by the Lumiere brothers. And again, I know I butchered that and I apologize for putting you through that. But I'm gonna stop the video here. I'd like you to go watch this in the playlist and then we'll pick back up afterwards.